Uh, probably the low point for me was um, uh, we had an incident in my town where a mentally deranged individual had taken his family hostage uh, and uh, had um, gone around the neighborhood stabbing all the neighbors' car tires. Oh, and geez. the reason for that is because all the neighbors were following him. Got it. So um, at some point, uh, mom takes the kids up to the second floor. I do not know you, but I am your brother. You do not know me, but I am your protector. I will run into a burning building to save your life. Though I do not know your name, I will take a bullet for you. Though we've never met, I, I believe, believe in, in duty, duty and sacrifice, sacrifice of self. Of self. Your, your family, family is my family. Is my family. Your life is my duty. What's going on guys? I am Kyle and I am honored to bring to you the very first episode in our brand new series called Behind the Uniforms. The whole idea of this series is that we are showcasing the men and women who are behind the uniform. So I've got a good friend, police chief with me. Why don't you go ahead and introduce yourself and we'll get this party started. Hi, my name is Mark Montmany and uh, I'm a police chief, been a, a law enforcement officer for about 31 years. Awesome. So the way that this show works is that our guests who come onto the show, they bring a bottle of whiskey for the whiskey wall and to share with all future guests, and then they have to share two stories. Uh, a positive, upbeat story, a funny story, and something that was difficult. Um, so first, let's talk whiskey. You want to talk whiskey? Okay. I bought a, a bottle of Johnny Walker here, so there's a, there's a reason for, behind that. So uh, I have a friend uh, who's about 75 years old. And he comes to me and he says, hey, I'd, I'd like to get my pistol permit. I've never gotten my pistol permit in my entire life. And now that I'm 75, I, I want my pistol permit. And I said, that's not a problem. All you're going to do is apply and you're going to have your fingerprints taken. We send them off to the FBI. And eventually the FBI comes back to us and says, yes, this person can have a pistol and you're good to go. So he goes, oh, great. So he fills out the application and sends it in. And I'm waiting for it to return. And I get a, a message back from the FBI saying, there's a hit on this person. <laughs> and it's so old that it's not digitized, we're gonna to have to search the manual file. Get out so of So somebody's here. actually gonna to have to go into the sub-basement and look through the files to find his record. <laughs> so I go back to my friend and I said, did you ever get arrested? He goes, no, no, I didn't, no, I don't remember ever getting arrested. I said, all right, we're gonna to have to wait now until the FBI gets back to us. <laughs> so three weeks later, we get the response back from the FBI. And it turns out what actually happened is when this 75-year-old was 16, he was walking down the street drunk carrying a bottle of Johnny Walker, <laughs> and he got stopped by the police. And the police officer says to him, uh, we'll call him Joe, uh, you know, Joe, what are you doing? And he says, oh, I'm just having a drink. Joe, you're only 16 years old. You can't be having a drink. And, and, and so uh, he, he arrests him, and uh, uh, during uh, the process, he asks him for his full name, and he looks down at the bottle, and he says, Walker. <laughs> Johnny Walker. So he was, be, he was being a, a pain in the ass at the time. Uh, but what I found was interesting is now we're 55, 58 years later, the, the report comes back from the FBI. He had been arrested for possession of alcohol by a minor, alias Johnny Walker. <laughs> that's great. So years that's later, he's still story. known as Johnny Walker. So that's why I call him now is Johnny. I love it. All right. So why don't we, uh, why don't we start low? Okay. Uh, difficult story. The, uh, guys, again, the whole idea behind this series is to show that uh, there are good days and there are difficult days, that there's no police officer out there who will ever put on a uniform or, or wear a badge to go out and to do harm. Um, they all want to kiss their families goodbye and be able to come home to them. And so that's why we sort of come through the highs and the lows in the show. So, so let's, let's start with the challenge. Well, the challenge is, you know, everybody, when they, when they want to be a police officer, they think of, you know, I want to do good for the community. I want, to, I want to help people, and I want to be in the thick of it. But no one ever says to themselves, could I really knock on someone's door at 10 o'clock at night and tell them that their son's dead? Because I guarantee you, at some point during the course of your career, that's what's going to happen to you. Right. Uh, probably the low point for me was... Um, uh, we had an incident in my town where a mentally deranged individual had taken his family hostage uh, and uh, had um, gone around the neighborhood stabbing all the neighbors' car tires. Oh, and geez. the reason for that is because all the neighbors were following him. Got it. So um, at some point, uh, mom takes the kids up to the second floor bedroom and she calls 911 and the police officers respond and um, when the police officers get there, they hear a gunshot inside the house. 
the assumption is that the family's in danger. So they try to kick in the front door. And the gentleman uh, are, looks out the window, sees the officers at the front door, and fires his gun and goes right through the, uh, the, the shoulder of one of the police officers. Oh, jeez. So um, at this point, all hands on deck. Everybody responds. We got the house surrounded. Uh, we managed to drag the officer away. Actually, the officer was able to walk away. Um, he's off to the hospital. Um, we're uh, trying to deal with this individual. Um, he, over the next hour, he files, fires 100 rounds of ammunition at the, oh at the officers. Oh, my God. Every cruiser in range was riddled with bullets. Um, family still in the house. Fa family still in the house. Uh, at some point, we have the negotiators talking to him, and he agrees to let the family out of the house, but he refuses to give up. And so he lets the family out of the house, and, um, and uh, uh, eventually uh, he ends up getting killed uh, by a police uh. sniper. Um, and, you know, you hate to do something like that when it's clearly a mental health issue. Right. But in this particular case, he left us no choice. Right. Um, I had gone uh, to the hospital to check on the officer because you can imagine what I'm thinking at this point. This is somebody who I'm responsible for ultimately. And uh, I know he's been shot, but I have no idea how badly wounded he is. And um, when I got to the hospital, they let me see him, and he was awake and conscious. And uh, the doctor came in, and I was shocked to, to hear that the bullet had passed through and had done no major damage. Wow. So it missed his vest because uh, it hit the strap, yeah. uh, and it went through, went through, went out the other side, and he was able to recover, and he returned to the police department. Wow. So. How, do you, how do you take all of this home with you? Because we have a lot of police officers who have come in here who are sharing stories in future episodes, and they talk about the challenges that they go through every single day, but you're sort of the compilation of all of that in, in the role that you're in. How do you take that home? Well, you don't. You have to be the right personality for the job. If you take it home and you can't sleep at night, you're in the long, wrong line of, of work. Sure. Uh, you have to be able to give it up at a certain point and step away from it. Now, there's two different things, uh, two different uh, skill sets that you have to develop. The first one is, you gotta be able to do your job when something extraordinarily bad is happening. And the way I do it is I say, do your job, think about it later. Do your job and think about, it. so you've got the, uh, the six year old that was just in the car wreck and he's gushing blood and do your job, think about it later. Sure. And, um, and then later, I refuse to think about it. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so, and, you know, later on, I mean, uh, th what happens is this kind of thing catches up to people. And if, it's, if, if you can't sleep at night because of what you experienced in the, in the previous eight or nine hours, then it, it's going gonna, it's gonna to compile on you and sure, get worse and worse. Yeah, it's a cumulative process. And uh, that's, what, that's kind of what PTSD is. It's, sure. it's a cumulative process. And you never know what's going to be the straw that breaks the camel's back. Um, but in, in my case, I make a conscious effort to separate from the job the minute I walk home. I don't want to bring it home to my family. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, I happen to have uh, a nurse in the family, and, and she uh, is an intensive care nurse, and she deals with just as gruesome sure. things that I, as I do. And uh, we can both uh, commiserate, so to speak, without, uh, without it impacting our personal lives. Gotcha. Time away is important. I mean, you, every once in a while, you need to, some time away. Absolutely. All right, so, so bring me back high. Give me something good. All right, I'll tell you about a, a funny motor vehicle stop. Uh, years ago in, 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 in our town, we used to have... Wait, this didn't involve Spongebob boxers, it did, did it? Not. Because it did not. But this is my story. Yeah, I'll let you tell that story <laughs> okay, now. Okay, go but ahead. <laughs> now, this, this involved a, a funny motor vehicle stop. We used to have a, a, a club in town that specialized on Friday nights. They had male strippers, and they attracted an entirely female <laughs> crowd. And, uh, and, you know, around 1 or 2 in the morning, uh, this crowd would empty out into the parking lot of the bar, and it was uh, a, a likely scenario for a drunk driver. So I happened to be sitting across the street paying attention to the, uh, to the parking lot, and I see a group of girls uh, getting into a car, and uh, it was clear that the driver saw me as well. I wasn't hiding. I, the lights were on, and you know, I was clearly standing there uh, across the street watching what was going on. And she saw me, she got into the car, and she's watching me, and she pulls out, she's looking over to see what I'm gonna do, and so I pulled behind her, and I let her go for two or three blocks. And like I said, there's got to be four or five women in this car. And eventually, I, I pull them over. So I step out of the car and I walk up. And my normal scenario is, uh, good evening, my name is Officer Montmany. Can I see your license, registration, insurance card? I didn't even get it out. She's got the window rolled down and she's screaming at me. 
I saw you from across the street. I know you're trying to uh, uh, arrest me for drunk driving. I haven't been drinking. I'm the designated driver in this group. I haven't had a drop. And she's just going off <laughs> on it. And she, and she finishes by saying, uh, so exactly, I want to know exactly why you pulled me over. I said, well, ma'am, if, uh, if I could start this Jeez. again. I, I pulled you over because it's 2 o'clock in the morning. She goes, I know exactly what time it is. I said, okay. Well, if you look around, you'll notice that everybody else is driving with their headlights on. <laughs> and all of a sudden she goes silent. She looks over to the headlight button. She pulls it out. The headlights go on. Everybody in the car cracks up laughing. <laughs> they all realize now that she was so intent on watching me. Yeah. She forgot to turn the headlights on. So I said, can I start over? She goes, yeah. I said, hi, I'm Officer Motmady from the police department. Can I see your lights registration? She goes, sure you can. Oh, and at that point, it, the, whole, the whole conversation was completely different. People are so confrontational sometimes, unnecessarily. Well, huh? even, even when it doesn't need to happen. Right. I mean, uh, uh, you know, I, I tell everybody... Um, I can tell you. I can tell you a, a dozen times where people talk themselves into tickets. Sure. Uh, uh, you know, <laughs> you know, if if you're uh, overtly rude for no particular reason, uh, and I, I don't take that tact. If I get pulled over by a police officer, right. uh, uh, I'm pleasant. I keep my hands in view. I don't, you know, I don't cause uh, any consternation. Whatever's going to happen happens. Well, I'll tell you. I have a confession. This is like police officer confession now. Like you're my priest. <laughs> so this was probably 10, 15 years ago, maybe. I was driving home one night and I, I got pulled over. And as soon as he pulled me over, he said, do you know why I pulled you over? I said, officer, I'm really sorry. I know I shouldn't be talking on my cell phone while driving. And he starts laughing. I said, what's so funny? He goes, well, I actually pulled you over for doing a Jersey roll through that stop sign back there, but thanks for letting me know about the cell phone thing. <laughs> I'm like, oh, you gotta be kidding me. He goes, can I offer you a piece of advice? I said, what's that? He goes, if an officer says, you know why I pulled you over, next time maybe just go with, no, sir. <laughs> so lesson learned. Don't admit to anything. But, well, Chief, thank you so much for joining. My uh, pleasure. Guys, those of you who are watching right now, thank you all for taking the time to, to watch and to share these stories. Hit that little share button at the bottom because this is how we reconnect. This is how we show that the men and women who serve and protect our communities and our country are just like you and us. So, Chief, thank you so much. Thank you for having God me. God bless. God bless America. We'll see you next time.